Hey there, welcome to LSAT Demon Daily. My name is Beth Noble, and today I'm joined by Brandon. We are teachers and tutors here at LSAT Demon, uh, which you can find at lsatdemon.com. And today we are going to talk about uh, a question that came in from the Ask button. So, uh, Brandon, do you want to read that question and kick us off? Yeah, sure. So this student writes, can I please get some advice as to how to tackle parallel reasoning or parallel flaw type questions? Something we hear all the time here at the Demon, especially on LR. Uh, I am horrendous, they continue. I am horrendous at them. <laughs> and it seems as though no matter how long I spend working through them, I get them wrong. Well, to this student, you are in good company. I think uh, you can speak to this, Beth. You teach a lot of our more uh, kind of fine-tuned LR classes here at the Demon. I, I certainly hear this a lot. I know that from my own study, I will be the one to raise my hand and say that I was like a classic parallel flaw skipper. When I saw it, I'd be like, oh, no, nope, I'll do that later. So I think this student is in uh, fair company here at the Demon, uh, but I think we're here today to kind of talk you through and sort of prove a little bit that it's not half as scary as you think it is, and that there are some ways that you can make this question type, in my opinion, really, really easy, like by comparison. I mean, I think that's true of most of the LSAT, but I think these are one of those question types that students give way too much credence and so they run and hide from them rather than figuring out the really sort of methodical way to just make them super simple. What's your take on that, Beth? Yeah, I agree. And I was in that same boat. I was so afraid of parallel reasoning questions, whether it was parallel flaw or they didn't tell me it was a flaw. I was terrified of them and I would skip them or I would just struggle through them and end up getting it wrong anyways or go down to two wrong answer choices and choose between them. Um, but Eventually, as I continued in my studying, it became something that I realized I wasn't going to be able to skip forever if I wanted to reach the scores I was hoping for um, and keep going with my studying. And the thing that finally made it click for me was that these are just like every other LR question. And actually, understanding them and getting really good at them helps you on every single kind of LR question. And honestly, I would say any part of the LSAT because it's constantly a test of reading comprehension, whether you're looking at LR, logic games, or reading comprehension. So it's just reading and understanding the passage. And I would actually say one of the things that I've been talking about recently in my LR classes is that these parallel questions are kind of in the must be true family of questions. It's just naming what the argument did. And so it's one of those questions that you don't say, okay, they did this, they confused, uh, or they assumed causation from correlation. Instead, you just have to choose something else that did the same thing. So you choose something that is supported or must be true from the passage. So it's just about understanding it. Um, so that was my experience too. And obviously that's the, the whole long view, but it was absolutely worth it putting in the time and effort to work on the thing that was a weakness for me at the beginning and probably in the middle for a long time too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking to that, I, I found you talked about your click moment for me with parallel. The click moment was for sure when I got down to the ability to identify argument parts, like when I could go, oh, that's absolutely the conclusion or when I could go, mm -hmm. oh, that's absolutely a premise or that sentence introduces or that clause introduces a certain kind of condition. When I got that skill nice and sharp parallel became a joke because when you can do that identification, the illusion that I use in my class is I frequently call them like Lego blocks or jigsaw pieces. You know, imagine a parallel is like a jigsaw puzzle, right? You have the box when you get started and the box is our passage. We know what it's going to look like, but we have to be able to say, okay, I need a corner piece. I need a middle piece and I need to connect the corner to the middle piece with this piece. We're doing something very similar when we identify those sort of subcomponents. And I don't want to get all mechanical or dogmatic about this. It's not we're not doing anything like proprietary or like trying to sell some sort of quick scheme here on how to get these right. It's just finding those pieces of the puzzle. And then in the answer choices, you're either going to be asked to identify an argument that essentially gets you to the same puzzle box picture, just using different words or different puzzle pieces, different shape pieces, or you're going to be asked to figure out why their puzzle doesn't work similarly to your original puzzle. It's like, oh, my original puzzle was missing a corner piece. 
Now I need to find the argument that is clearly missing the same corner piece. Like I've used that illusion to sort of crystallize this idea of all we're really doing on parallel is taking an argument, good or bad, what have you, and then saying, okay, this piece, this piece, and this piece were all present. So sort of like on a flaw where the argument has to do it and it has to be wrong, on a parallel, your correct answer choice has to have all those pieces. And regardless of the orientation of those pieces in sort of the document flow, if you will, like the way they're presented or the structure that they're presented, they've all got to be there. And logically, they have to proceed in the same way, whether that's in a flawed way or a reasonable way. They have to get you to the same finish line by using those same kinds of pieces. So yeah, when it came to getting this to click, I was like, okay, now that I know what I'm looking for, man, talk about the most predictable questions on the LSAT. It's almost like a sufficient assumption in that, like you're saying about must be trues. It's exact, you need exactly this and anything else, a deviation from that is just going to be wrong. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that comes up all the time. I hear people ask about that all the time of, you know, the the conclusion was at the end in the in the main passage that I was reading. And then I saw that there was a conclusion at the beginning and answer choice B or something. So I eliminated it. But that's not our goal, right? Our goal is actually the content and what the argument does. We don't care what order it goes in. Yeah. So I yeah. And that's a that's a cool analogy too the puzzle the missing puzzle piece um, or Lego pieces too. And I would say as far as so this person asked how to tackle them. That's the main first piece, right? Is understanding the argument, understanding what the conclusion does. And another question that I have really loved lately is first, can you identify the conclusion? Second question after that, is this conclusion valid or is it not valid? And all that means is, is it supported by the evidence that they gave or is it not? Nine times out of 10 on the LSAT, maybe even more than that, it's not going to be a valid conclusion. They will have even the tiniest hole in their argument. And if they do, it's our job to spot it and know that's not a valid conclusion and point that out. And then our job on parallel questions like this or like these ones that we're talking about is to go, okay, why exactly is it not supported? And that can get us to finding the correct answers on parallel questions. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you say? Let's put uh, let's give it a shot and put our money where our mouth is and see if we can do it. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds great. All right, sweet. Uh, do you want to read our our paragraph here, our, our passage? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Okay, Brandon's kicking it off to me because we're starting with a big science-y word, so I've got <laughs> it. <laughs> um, so we're looking at test 65, section four, question 24, if anybody wants to look it up on their own. Um, and maybe try it before you hear us go through it. Um, so we've got paleomycologists, um, which, you know what? I don't know what those are, Me but neither. there's a comma right there. And the LSAT is about to tell us. So as much as I was like, okay, we've got a big word here. They're going to tell us everything we need to know, right? Um, so paleomycologists, scientists who study ancient forms of fungi. Awesome. And now I don't even need to look it up or bother with that. Um, are invariably, it says acquainted with the scholarly publications of all other paleomycologists. So pausing there, as I always do in LR passages and arguments, I'm going to gather it and make sense of it, right? So these scientists who study ancient forms of fungi, fungi are all acquainted with publications of other people in their field, which is interesting because I start to question like, is it a small field? Is that why? invariably acquainted, that sounds pretty sure that they're going to be acquainted with the other public publications and know what's going on in their field. Um, so kind of interesting. But again, talking about argument parts, already I know that's just a fact. They've told me uh, what a paleomycologist is, and they tell me a fact about them. That they're acquainted with other publications of the people in their field. It's also a conditional fact, right? Like it's introduced yeah. a conditional here that if you are a paleomycologist, then you are invariably acquainted with scholarly publications. Like you do yeah. know that stuff if you are one of these. Right. And the way that they said it, right? Like we can't argue with it. That's right. That's true based on this passage. And they, they go on. They say uh, Professor Mansour is acquainted with the scholarly publications of Professor DeAngelis, who is a paleomycologist. Okay, so they, teed it up. <laughs> they have, they have, what's going to happen? 
Uh, they're going to make a claim. I know already the kind of claim they're going to make. Um, they say that Professor, Man they don't tell me what profession Professor Mansour has, but they tell me that Professor Mansour is acquainted with Professor DeAngelis, who is, or the publications, excuse me, of Professor DeAngelis, who is a paleomycologist. So I already know from a mile away, they're going to tell me that Professor Mansour is a paleomycologist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, forgot the word there. But I'm already expecting that because I'm used to the LSAT committing the same flaws again and again. So we will finish it out. But I was already expecting that. And it finishes and says, therefore, Professor Mansour must also be a paleomycologist. Exactly what I was already expecting as I was reading through this argument. They have done a fatal flaw on the LSAT. And it's really easy to spot once you know this flaw. Like Brandon was talking about, right? We had this something that was necessary at the beginning. They told us that if you are a paleomycologist, you are acquainted with all other scholarly publications by other paleomycologists. And then, Brandon, what, what did they do at the end? Then? What, what was the mistake they made? Sufficient for necessary and classic in a textbook example. So like you were saying, Beth, we kind of proceed into that second premise now that we know that conditional statement. If you're a paleomycologist, then you definitely know the works of your colleagues, basically, is what our argument is said, right? Then they've said, OK, Professor Mansur is acquainted with scholarly publications by a paleomycologist, Professor, De Professor DeAngelis, which, again, is teeing up that mistake. Because all they've said there is we have this professor and they've met, really, they've met part of a necessary condition of a different sufficient condition. They've met that, yeah, they are acquainted with the work of a paleomycologist, the necessary condition introduced in our first premise. But then they go on to mistakenly conclude, therefore, Professor M, Professor Mansur has got to be a paleomycologist. And so, OK, well, hold on, LSAT. That's not necessarily the case, right? We got to be very careful with that. All we know, you know, Professor Mansur could be a professor of biology. They could be an anthropologist. They could be any number of things. And we haven't explicitly been told that they are a paleomycologist. So we mm -hmm. don't invariably know, to use their term here, we don't definitely know that they would be acquainted with that stuff, even though we're granted it. And we can't assume that they've met the sufficient condition for that necessary condition on the facts we've been provided, which, again, textbook, sufficient for necessary flaw, They'll sort of tee you up for uh, this if then statement, you know, a very clear if then statement. And then they'll say, well, we've met the then part. Therefore, we must have met the if part too. And we don't get to conclude that we can't we can't invariably conclude that. So, again, we're talking parallel questions here, and I feel like we've sort of beat the paragraph to death. But I love doing mm -hmm. that on parallel. Like the hard part is just really grappling with the paragraph before you ever look at any of those scary, long answer choices that everybody loves to ignore and skip. But man, we know exactly what we need here. Like it turns out that this is going to be a parallel flaw question, because like we identified, they've made not only a critical flaw, but the LSAT's most common flaw, insufficient for necessary confusion. And the question reads, the flawed pattern of reasoning in the argument above is most similar to that in which one of the following arguments, which is awesome because in these five answer choices, we know exactly what we're looking for and we know exactly how the argument kind of needs to proceed. So a correct answer choice without reading any of these is going to need to present a conditional statement, sort of whether it's explicit or otherwise. It's going to need to give us sort of an if-then scenario to match up to our paleomycologists invariably knowing the work of their colleagues, right? That's step one. We need that puzzle piece to follow the earlier, earlier illusion. Then we need to have a premise that a fact given to us that sort of engages with that idea, ideally the necessary condition part. Well, here's someone or something that meets that condition, that necessary side in particular. And then last but not least, our last puzzle piece is we need a conclusion that definitely screws up that specific issue that goes, well, we've met our necessary condition, therefore we must have met our sufficient one too. And regardless of whether they say this in purely abstract terms, whether they say this in like an they articulate some sort of scenario. Uh, they have to do those things. So all we have to do is sort of translate the, the puzzle pieces into whatever terminology they give us. 
And ding, 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 that'll be the right answer for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think about that too, we don't have to spend the amount of time. We'll, we'll show it too. So maybe we right. should do show, not tell. We don't have to spend the same amount of time that we do on the passage because as soon as we see a problem, we're going to get rid of an answer choice. Absolutely. Every time. And that's that's where it comes that you don't have to spend the length of how long you do on each passage on each answer choice in parallel. Other thing that I would point out right here, just because we read the question, uh, not all parallel questions will flag being flawed. This one does explicitly say the flawed pattern of reasoning. If you get to a question that says that and you don't know what the flaw is, that is your check engine light. Stop the car. Go figure out what the flaw is, because I promise you the answer choices are not going to illuminate what the flaw is. That is your point. Just like on flaw questions, if you're just trying to pick apart a flaw, if you didn't notice an argument was flawed, go figure out what that is because it'll make the question so much easier when you actually get in the answer choices. And then other thing on that is sometimes it'll just say which one matches the pattern of reasoning found in the argument or something. And that doesn't mean it's not flawed. Oftentimes the hired number questions won't let you know if it's going to be flawed or not, but it doesn't mean it can't be. Flawed. Absolutely. That's an excellent point. If I love the check engine light idea, I'm going to I'm going to steal that from you in class this week for sure. The next time I do parallel, if you're reading yeah. that question, just to double down on what Beth said, if you hit that question and it identifies like, what is the flaw here? I don't care if it's parallel or otherwise. And you didn't see a flaw. Stop. <laughs> like, do not proceed. Turn around. That is your that's your reverse card in Uno to go back to that passage and find out what you missed, because you're definitely not going to just figure it out in the answer choices. Mm -hmm. They're going to be more abstract or more convoluted in most cases than what you just read, or they're going to use language that throws you deliberately. So go back to that passage, find what you missed. And if if you're struggling with that spot right now, if that's a skill that you still need to sharpen up, this is a great opportunity in your drilling and in your blind review to work on that skill is to say, well, I got into those answer choices before I had identified any flawed reasoning, and I shouldn't have done that. And if you're still doing that, listeners, you got to correct that error now to master this question type. I really genuinely believe that. Yeah. What do you yeah. say? I feel I feel like we know what we're looking for. So you ready to go find it? We do. Yeah, let's All do right. it. Um, Sweet. Yeah. Cool. So A says, when a flight on global airlines is delayed, okay, when something happens, that kind of sounds like an if, right? And then says all connecting global airline flights are also delayed so that the passengers can make their connections. Totally sounds like a conditional, right? We've got yep. if a flight on global airlines is delayed, then the connecting global airlines flights are also going to be delayed. And that's so that you can make your connecting flight. So that sounds like a necessary condition to me of uh, if this happens, then this happens. Great. That doesn't mean we're done with this answer choice. It just because it's matching up at the beginning. Okay, I like that. I don't see any red flags, so I'm going to keep going. It then says, since Frida's connecting flight on Global was delayed, her first flight must have also been a delayed Global Airlines flight. They did it. Yep. We don't know. Yeah, we, we don't know. Um, the first flight that Frida took might have been on time for all we know. Or maybe Frida is even playing the airlines and she took a Delta flight on her first flight and then connected onto Global to get a cheaper flight or something like that or to go somewhere obscure. We have no idea what Frida's first flight was. Just because Frida got on this connecting flight that was delayed, that was our necessary, right? But we don't know the sufficient part which was if your flight on global airlines was delayed. We don't have proof of that. Yeah. So that they're doing the same thing with su confusing sufficient for necessary. They're missing a piece. And so they haven't proven it in the same way. Um, just like they said, the professor must also be a paleomycologist. They didn't prove that to me. For all I know, just like the professor, Frida could have been on a different flight or not had it delayed and the delay started with her, her flight being the first domino. Yeah, absolutely. Just as a way to sort of double down on this and make sure that this idea sticks for anyone who's still struggling with this. First of all, this is definitely going to be the correct answer. Um, we have 
like Beth was saying, they introduced an if-then statement in their first sentence, right? If your flight on global is delayed, then your connecting flights, all connecting flights are also delayed. Then the next clause engages the necessary condition, right? Since Frida's connecting flight on global was delayed, so we know her connecting flight was delayed. The necessary condition from that original if-then statement has been met. And then it proceeds, mm -hmm. well, it has to be the case then that... Uh, that she that her first flight must have also been a delayed global flight. What if the pilot had a heart attack? Right. There are a million ways to yeah. get to that necessary condition. We don't know invariably that this one sufficient condition that would make that happen was what happened. And that's really the gap here. That's really the essence of the flaw is there are a million ways to get through or to get to a delayed global airlines flight. And that first of them doesn't have to be the one in this case as it was written. So it's it's a perfect parallel scenario to our original paragraph. Right. And uh, one of the things that I want to like reiterate for our students here is I get this question a lot in classes. OK, Brandon, answer choice A was perfect. Are you like are you done? Are you moving on now? And no, frankly, I'm not. And here's why. One, I love telling the 80% of the LSAT that's wrong, why it's wrong. I love doing that because that is where my learning happened personally. And two, I think it's I think it just flexes the the muscle of knowing why you're right, like being able to explain this like we are to each other. We're going to go through B through E here and we're going to be able to clearly articulate why they are not parallel reasoning, in this case, parallel flawed reasoning to our original argument. There are lots of ways this could happen. They could actually make a good argument. That's one way that it could be a wrong answer choice here is our original argument was flawed. If we get valid logic here, that's obviously wrong because it's not flawed, for example. Or one other way we could easily screw this up is if the sort of intermediary clause plays with the sufficient condition, but not the necessary one. Like there are lots of ways we could go sideways here. And as soon as we've flagged one of those problems, we can quickly eliminate that answer choice, sometimes without having to read the entire thing. Now, I want to put you know the asterisk on that. Here at the Demon, we definitely tell you, you need to read that entire answer choice and you need to eliminate it with certainty. But sometimes you can be one sentence in and have that certainty. It does happen. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. encourage any of our listeners that might be struggling with like their confidence or the ones that are letting answer choices boss them around. One, make sure you're proceeding with that knowledge of the passage. But two, challenge yourself a little bit. As soon as you get to that that fork in the road that is clearly not what our passage did, flip it the bird and move on. Like tell it, tell it it's wrong because and have the confidence to proceed, especially now that in answer choice A, we found a perfectly paralleled flaw, a, how to say this, a perfectly flawed argument in parallel. There we go. There's the English. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Just on that too, though, too, sometimes yeah, we call that like LSAT hygiene of uh, mm. just, yes, I love A, I chose it. Um, sometimes also referred to as like, I call it idiot proofing myself too. Yeah. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. I am not infallible. Yes. I've been doing this test, but I still have, you know, I still can miss questions. Oftentimes it's because I make the same mistake that students who are studying right now do, which is where I go too fast. I'm overconfident, something like that. But that is like my LSAT hygiene is I'm still going to check every answer choice because I'm not going to let, let them pull a fast one on me. And for me to miss something, too. Yeah. Uh, Brandon, why don't you take B? Yeah, let's take a look here. So B reads, any time that one of Global Airlines local ticket agents misses a shift, sounds like an if to me, the other agents on that shift need to work harder than usual. OK, so it has presented an if then statement. So any time, meaning if this occurs, uh, so if uh, one of Global Airlines local ticket agents misses a shift, so whenever they miss a shift, then the other agents working that shift work harder than usual. That has to happen. OK, so from here, if I was going to find a correct answer choice, I would need my next sentence to play with the other agents on the shift having to work harder. Like that's what our original paragraph did. So now I'm kind of like skeptical that they're going to do that one because we found our great answer choice in A. But two, because I know what I'm looking for. I know what it's got to say. So let's keep going. It says, since none of Global's local ticket agents missed a shift last week. OK, so again, they've played with the sufficient condition now. We know that that didn't occur. OK, 
The airline's local ticket agents did not have to work harder than usual last week. OK, so this is another version of a sufficient for necessary flaw in that we've negated the sufficient condition. We've talked about what happens when uh, a ticket agent misses their shift, but we have no clue what happens when the ticket agent doesn't come to their shift. Again, there are a million ways that people have to work harder. What if it's the middle of COVID and you're completely short staffed and it just sucks no matter whether people miss their shift or not? You have to work hard anytime you're at work. This is just one of those occasions where we know definitively that that happens. Again, that's another version of a sufficient for necessary flaw. But the important thing here, to go back to what I was mentioning earlier about the puzzle pieces, is they played with the wrong part of the if-then statement. Instead of mm -hmm. saying, we've satisfied our necessary condition, therefore we know our sufficient condition was satisfied, what B does instead is, well, we didn't satisfy our sufficient condition, therefore we didn't satisfy our necessary condition. And that's another form of confusing sufficient for necessary. So whereas our paragraph did play with the necessary condition and then screw that up insufficient for necessary. B does something similar, but it doesn't proceed the same way. I would be willing to guess, I haven't looked here, but I would be willing to guess this is the most incorrectly picked wrong answer because this is an easy one to miss if you don't understand the relationship between a sufficient and necessary condition. I see this all the time in class. So again, we don't necessarily need to look at the data to, to prove this out, but I could easily see a student making that mistake going, oh, well, yeah, they can view sufficient for necessary. And that's what they did in the passage. So B's got to be the answer. I think to your point earlier, Beth, of like these later, like this is a question 24. This is later in a yep. section. This is a tough one. I, I think this is a relatively easy one, but this would be a tough one for like a newer to an intermediate student because you really yeah. have to understand the if then relationships and how our author originally played with those ideas. But yeah, we get to be here. We've read through it. We've torn it to shreds. We can obviously eliminate it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I was thinking the same thing about this being a higher numbered question. If it's going to be an earlier question or this actually, I, I don't think happens a ton where they have multiple sufficient for necessary flaws or doing it in different ways. Yeah. It's like you're testing something so specific um, and I don't think it comes up super often, but you totally explained why that is not going to be our answer though, especially because we loved A so much. It's like the bar is even higher because we yeah. have an answer choice we already love. Cool. So C says anytime the price of fuel decreases. OK, so we've got anytime again. This is another if coming. Right. If this happens, global airlines expenses decrease and its income is unaffected. OK, so if the price of fuel decreases, this airline, the, the airline's expenses decrease and the income is unaffected, unaffected. Excuse me. Um, interesting. If this happens, then this happens. That again is like they're giving me something that is sufficient to guarantee that uh, global airlines expenses decrease and then nothing happens to the income. Then they say the price of fuel decreased several times last year. OK, so we're already meeting what is sufficient. We're meeting it. And then it says, therefore, global airlines must have made a profit last year. So their expenses decrease and income is unaffected. Didn't really break that out, but that means, you know, they're not spending more money on what it takes to make a profit and their income stays the same. So that makes sense. That is already valid logic. They conclude that Global Airlines is making a profit because the price of fuel has decreased several times. So that's meeting what needs to happen in order for them to continue making a profit. Their income stays the same, whereas their expenses go down. So the profit margin can widen. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that's a good argument. And C is yeah, out on that. For sure. One thing I also wanted to point out here, just for people working on their argument part identification, notice how in C, our first sentence, it introduces a compound necessary condition. That's not a disqualifier here, but it actually has two things that have to be true when the price of fuel decreases. So when the price of fuel decreases, one thing happens, expenses decrease. And another thing happens, global's income remains unaffected. To your point, Beth, the way we can kind of call this valid is we can sort of concatenate those two ideas into, oh, their profits go up, right? Which is how we how we can call this a valid argument. But I want to make sure that our students out there are seeing that that and is actually kind of a powerful and here. It's two things going on as a result of this first sufficient thing. 
And whether you're working mm-hmm. on logic games or argument parts in LR, mastering that concept of like, oh, when this if thing occurs, then there are more there's more than one thing that has to occur as well. And that compound yes. necessary condition, I think, is something that, again, on advanced parallel questions, I've seen them test that there aren't enough necessary conditions in one answer choice versus another. So work on that skill, like find that skill to our students. Yeah, definitely. And just like games, it's it's saying the same thing as if a if a rule said if A is in, then B and C are in. Right. Right. Cool. So C is out. Yeah, let's take a look at D here. All employees of Global Airlines, so 100% of them, can participate in its retirement plan after they have been with the company a year or more. Okay, so 100% of Global's employees can join the retirement plan once they've been with the company for over a year. So we have that sort of necessary condition there, is if you're a Global employee, then you can do the retirement plan once you've been there for a year. So our necessary condition is once you've been there for a year. Okay. Gavin has been with Global Airlines for three years. Okay. So he's met the necessary condition, right? He's he's been there for enough time to be in the in the retirement plan. We can therefore be sure, says D, that he participates in Global's retirement plan. Oh, can we? No, we can't say that he definitely participates in the retirement plan. We just know that one of the requirements, this is something I like to use as a concept for necessary conditions. It's a requirement of joining the retirement plan that you be there for a year. Well, what if Gavin is 25 and isn't even thinking about his 401k and doesn't give a crap and he'd rather just have that money in his pocket? Well, sure, he's met the requirement, but that doesn't mean he's opted in to the plan. What we know Mm -hmm. about the plan doesn't automatically tell us anything about Gavin. We just know that Gavin has met the requirement for that to occur. And even more basically, this is just completely different than what our paragraph said originally, what our original passage reads. You know, it doesn't play with the right concepts. It introduces a necessary condition, which was good on its face. But then it brings up this idea that we know that Gavin has opted in or he has met the sufficient condition. And we again, we can't conclude that from what we've been told on the page. So D is for sure out. Yeah, definitely. Cool. So let's finish it out with E. So E says, whenever a competitor of Global Airlines reduces its fares, Global must follow suit or lose passengers. Interesting. Already. Okay. So if this thing happens, whenever a competitor, and that's all the time, whenever a competitor does this, Global must follow suit or lose passengers. Sounds like a classic capitalism, you know, the whole... Let's let's compete for this thing going on. I want you to use me instead. So I'm going to follow suit, reduce my fares or else people are going to stop flying with me. Um, It then says global carried more passengers last year than it did the year before. Okay, so kind of predicting already. They're probably going to say that is probably going to be because other places have reduced their fares or other competitors have reduced their fares. But all we know, though, is that global carried more passengers. And then it says, therefore, Global must have reduced its fares. I'm already out. I'm out on this answer choice already. But it says that Global must have reduced its fares last year to match reductions in its competitors' fares. Um, The problem here is that we don't have evidence that this happened, right? So they must have reduced their fares last year to match reductions. That's only one of the things that could lead to Global reducing their fares. But we don't know that that was actually the thing. And for all we know, global, that that thing could have happened, but it doesn't guarantee that global would carry more passengers. So it's not even doing some, giving us something that is necessary for global to gain passengers, right? So we don't have a necessary condition here. We know that global has to follow suit or lose passengers, but we're not told that a competitor reducing fares is necessary for global to gain passengers. They're missing that piece and that's not happening. So I was already out on that answer choice there, but just to to go for why that's missing it and why it's not parallel, plenty of other things could have caused people to fly with global over other airlines. 
maybe just more flights. Say it was uh, 2022 or something. <laughs> 2022 probably had way more passengers than 2021 because, uh, you know, coming to the tail end of a pandemic or like, I don't know, maybe still in it, but people just started flying again and picked up. Global could have more passengers for many reasons other than other competitors reducing fares. So they're missing information there. It's still not a valid argument, but it's not doing the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Ease out for several reasons that you've well articulated here. One thing that I want to sort of underscore before we wrap things up is I see this all the time in class. I'm sure you do too, Beth, is a lot of my students will get through those five answer choices and they get to the bottom of E, not really knowing what they were looking for. And their mind is now just fog and soup. Their mind is just like they have no idea what they're talking about. They're very confused. Whereas if they develop that set of skills and they can go through this process like you and I just demonstrated, they can find A right away. I think it is one really important, but then they can solve problem number two, which is going through B through E with absolute confidence that they're going to be wrong and then being able to be like, oh yeah, there it is. That's why it's wrong. It did this one thing very specifically, see ya. And I love what you said in the middle of E there where you're like, I'm already out on this answer choice. That was a that was a transcendent moment for me in LR study where I got the confidence built up to be able to do what you just did is to say, nope, I, it can't possibly be this. I'm going to flex that muscle. I'm going to work through this. I'm going to work the system. But I already see the obviously wrong thing here. And I think that's something that on parallel, I bring this back to a confidence issue because I see a lot of students saying, oh, I skip parallel because it's too much to read and I don't know what I'm doing. So I just go past it and then I bubble in an answer if it's still there when I'm done with the section. And I just think that's such a backwards way of approaching this concept, because like what you said at the beginning, if they can sharpen this skill, this becomes one of the easiest question types because it is a must be true. You just have to find the thing that the author did originally and it's cash money. Yeah, definitely. And last thing I'll say about parallels and just going back to the original question of the student who is really struggling through them and feeling like it's taking a long time. And then what Brandon and I were talking about that I was in the boat of for a while, I skipped parallel questions because I was so afraid of them and I thought I didn't know how to do them or couldn't learn. The mistake I was making and that I see students make too is that if you are doing the LSAT the right way, what I think is the right way or the easy way, you have no idea that it's a parallel question when you're reading the passage anyways. So that's always a red flag to me if students are like, hey, I, I'm just going to skip these. Is that OK right now? And I'm not OK with that. And I want you to have the same expectations for yourself. Set the bar higher. Do the work. Understand the passage. Figure out what the problem is. And then you're suited to answer any question about the passage. And if you're just preparing to skip parallel questions, you're going to do this like negative confidence loop. If you're looking for the question before, finding out it's a parallel and then just going, I can't do this. But we don't want you reading the question first. We want you reading and understanding the passage. And no matter what it is, like this question could have been just a flaw question. And we could have named what the flaw was because we read the passage first. We don't read the question first. Yeah, absolutely. And to those of you who are saying, well, I figure it out, Beth, because I see that the answer choices are long. Well, you're cheating, too. and You're just putting it under a different name. <laughs> got to read yeah. the passage. You got to start with what you were given and you got to tear it to yeah. pieces. And when you do, like we're not just trying to sell you guys on some approach here. When you get this down, you're going to be able to just eviscerate these arguments on any front. You're going to be able to tell if it's right. You're going to be able to tell it if it's wrong. And most importantly, you're going to be able to say why, which yeah. Again, if you're skipping parallel today, I hope we've helped you. I hope that this is a nice refresher on this topic. If it hasn't been, can't encourage you enough to go to our foundations courses, to go to Flawless 5 or Perfect 10 with Beth during the weekdays. This is a this is a set of classes that can really up your game on these topics for sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't start with the question 24 parallels. You know, they pop yeah. up in the first uh, 10, 15 questions of the LSAT, which will on average be easier then the later questions, it goes up average difficulty. So start with those easier ones, drill that way, practice that way, and it'll set you up to really learn those skills and know how to spot it when you get to these harder ones too. For sure. Any uh, closing tips for our, our LR students on parallels? No, that's it. I mean, best of luck, stick with it. It is absolutely worth it to understand how to destroy these arguments and use the skills from other LR questions too. Absolutely.
All right. You can email daily at lsatdemon.com if you'd like to ask us a question or share some LSAT or law school admissions news. Thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.